City strike. Horses, chicks, and dogs, they are my neighbors. I cook and some spin and move the horses in to the barn. Then time to move them out again. Red barns, green pastures, beautiful my houses. The view I see each day when I arise. This light it pleases me. It is plain to see I'm living my bucolic life. Hello. All right, so we're going to get started with the next set of this uh, Chanel suit, and that is going to be making again Vogue 8804. Now, the last time I made it, I put together a playlist called the Cardigan Jacket. And that was making this pattern, but kind of like a trial run, just making it as a standard jacket, not the Chanel method. This time, we are going to be making it the Chanel method. And going to be taking information from this book. Okay, this is the Cardigan Jacket book that Claire Schaefer wrote and learned a lot going through the Chanel skirt using her book, figuring out the best way to use it and things like that. So what I'm going to be doing this time, just setting the groundwork here, is I'm going to be putting together this suit so that um, the main construction of it lines up with the same that she does. However, I may do things in a different order. I may use a slightly different marking method for different parts, you know. Um, I may cut things slightly different than she does, but the overall concept is going to be to make this suit as close as possible to what is well, first, what is written in the instructions for this pattern, but also what she has put in her book that corroborates along with her huge Chanel suit collection. So there you go. So the first thing that I want to do is show you my trims, my fabrics, and things like that. So if you haven't already seen the video on the skirt, you might want to look at that just because... I go in depth in a lot of ways on her methods there. And um, if you're interested how I modified this pattern that went from being a longer pattern to being a shorter two pocket version, in that playlist I also have a uh, video explaining that because I did have to make some modifications. And this jacket is for my daughter who is in another state. so I made up the trial version so that we could fit it on her. It's good, and now I'm ready to make the real version, I guess you would say. So, the same fabric that I use for the skirt, I'm using for this jacket. It is a um, rosy peach pearly kind of color. I don't know how it comes across on your computer, but that's what it looks like to me in real life. And for the trims, I'm going to be using a combination of two things. One is the selvage edge from this fabric. And I did use this on the skirt also. So that's going to be at the very edge. And then what I'm going to be using as the braid then is this. And I was playing with a few different things and I like this braid. And what this is is one that I've made and it is a combination of this, here we go, this gimp, you know, which is a very cream colored gimp, of some piping that's another creamy pearly colored piping, and then also a strip 
that I've just cut from the fabric that's just three rows of the very wide uh, weave of the fabric. It's, it's quite thick, so using the right side of that. So I think that that makes actually a really pretty combination. Um, at first I was thinking of just using this with it, but that looked too much like upholstery to me and I was not happy with that. So the first step that I am going to be doing is to cut out my pattern. Now when she's using the book and as we saw when I was making the skirt, she wants the pattern pieces cut larger than the actual, the, the fabric for the pattern piece cut larger. So, so say for example, I'm going to be cutting this piece out. This is a side front and I'm going to be needing to cut two of them. All right. In, when I'm cutting it out, first thing is I'm going to make very, very sure that it's on the grain line. And since I can see through here and my, my weave is so bold, I can line that up pretty well. But what I'm going to be doing is this pattern piece has a 5 8 inch seam allowance built into it. I'm going to bump it out an extra half inch so I, that way I have at least a 1 inch seam allowance around the whole thing. And that way, when I'm doing the quilting, let's say like this piece has two rows of quilting stitches. Okay, or maybe three. It might have three. I need to double check. Um, if there is any, you know, shrinking or anything like that because of the quilting stitches, because I am cutting my pattern pieces bigger, it should have enough to to blend in. So that's how I'm going to do it. So the first thing I'm going to be doing is cutting out my pieces from my fashion fabric and because I want to make double sure that I am cutting them out on grain, I'm going to do them one at a time. So say I will cut this side and then I will flip it over and cut this side and I will do that for all of it. So on this jacket there is a it's a princess seamed jacket, so there's a front, a side front, and under the arm, a side back, and a back. Okay? All of those in the jacket. And then it's a three-part sleeve, so there's three parts to each sleeve. So there's going to be a lot of pieces cut out, but they actually go together, usually, I will hope, fairly well. So I'm not going to actually show that on camera because it's going to be a whole lot of making things fit because I'm... I mean, I just want to make sure that I have enough fabric to give myself enough space, make sure everything is on grain. So whatever fabric you have, you know, you will have to make those own manipulations for yourself. I am just taking a little time after I have my pieces cut out here to get all of my trim and braid made up for the whole project. Uh, I just want to have that done and out of the way before I get started. So I thought I would show you my process. You know, everyone can pick their own kind of braid. You know, there's unlimited options out there. But because I am uh, making something similar to this, okay, which is basically braiding three different things together, um, the pieces that I need to do is I need to do a short little one for each pocket. I need to do one that's going to come up beyond the buttons, down and around the bottom of each cuff, and then the long one that goes around the neck. So um, I'm just getting started actually with the cuff ones right now. And there is a piece that this is actually for interfacing, but it gives you a pretty good idea of the size of the piece that I'm going to need. So I just kind of measured the height over um, I technically don't go up the other side, it's just one side and up because the other one is folded underneath. Actually, this one is underneath. Um, but I'm making this strip extra long so that I can cut the ends off and make it into the pocket flaps. So that's how I'm doing it. I'm just kind of getting a rough idea. Once I have my real long strip done, I'm going to come back and uh, sew in a little corner here, and I'll show you how I do that so that it's already uh, formed and everything, so when it comes time to put it on, I don't need to fiddle with it anymore. 
And like I said, this is actually piping, but I'm trimming the tape off of it because I really just want the little twisty pearl cording part. If I leave all the tape on it, it makes it too wide when I'm braiding it together. So I have this. This is my gimp and I, I literally just cut it in half. Um, it was like this and you just trim straight down the middle and separate it. So I have two pieces, one for each because I'm making two strips right now. And then the last thing I need is a long strip of um, from my fabric. And basically what I'm doing is I need three threads thick. So it's a pretty dense weave, but I'm gonna be cutting a little strip that's three threads wide, and then using that as the third in my braid. All right, so I have enough to get started with. So what I'm gonna do is just tape the ends together so they wanna stay put. And then I'm gonna tape the whole thing to my table. All right, and then that's gonna hold it pretty steady so I can get started just making a braid. And I'm just braiding it like you're braiding hair, you know. And I have cut basically one yard long strips. And so um, I am hoping that, you never know exactly how much that's gonna cinch up with a braid, but I'm hoping that that's gonna be long enough. So that's how I'm doing it. Well, I wanted to show you, I've got a couple pieces that I think are gonna be long enough to handle the um, around the cuff and then up the side. And what I wanted to show you is once I had it all done, I pressed it and then on the back side uh, I cut a like half inch or one centimeter wide strip of uh, fusible trico and I fuse that to the back and I think that that's going to help hold that braid in position and keep it nice and secure and I think that it turned out really pretty. I like that. So what I need to do is figure out where to put that um, 90 degree angle. And it looks like, because there's gonna be a seam allowance here, and it'll be right on the inside of that, alongside of where these buttonholes are gonna be going. So if I give myself, say, two inches above here, let me move this over a bit. Okay, so if I give myself two inches above there, come down, and again, I have a seam allowance. And I'm gonna turn and go across that way, okay? Right about here is where I need to make this turn. So I'm going to get a needle and thread and basically just kind of fold it into position like this, probably behind, you know, every braid is different. Figure out what works. And you can see, I've got a couple little loose pieces there from when I cut that gimp in half. But I'll just sew this little corner with my needle and thread and that way it's going to hold that position so when it comes time to put it on I'm ready. So this one I'll do this way and then I'll do one the opposite way so it's the long side and then the upright over here. All right well it's actually been a few hours and I am just about done and I wanted to show you really quickly how I am um, finishing up shaping my neckline. And it's because the way that I'm having to do it this time is different than last time because my braid is so much thicker and I was only able to do it in shorter sections. I couldn't do it in long section because of the amount of materials I had. So basically what I did is I did three separate sections. This one here I cut and molded so that it lines up with my guide, okay? So that then this end, like I showed you before, I fused a um, narrow strip of that Trico fusible uh, strips on there that I had cut down to size. So up here, what I had to do 
is take, you know, about an inch of it and just kind of wrap it together on this side. I kind of put the fabric part on top and the gimp and the little binding underneath it and I just went to town with some stitches here. Now, to make sure that nothing's going to fray out and everything, you know, clear nail polish. So after stitching everything on there and trying my best to make sure I have all my little loose ends taken care of, I coat the whole back with clear nail polish and let it dry. Then the other strip that I'm attaching to it, what I did is got to the end and took off the tape that was holding it. And this is another piece of that fusible Trico tape that I just folded over and ironed, okay? So this is just kind of compressed in here between two layers of fusible that's gonna hold it gently in place. So now I can trim down the sides a little bit and the top a little bit so that it's nice and compact. And then just double checking to make sure that I have my fabric going the right way. What I'm gonna come and do is just place it behind here like that. And because I'm placing it with this part, this is making it as flat as possible because it's already gonna have quite a bit of bulk. So now with this just placed behind here, I'll just, you know, go to town with my thread and make a whole bunch of stitches, but try to make them blend and hide as much as possible. So this one I already did. And you can see on the back, it's not very pretty, but it's, it's substantial and it'll hold it. And then after I got all these stitches done, I coated the back again with clear nail polish, okay? So then this whole part will be done and I'm ready just to put away my trim for a little while. If you can't tell, this is going to be a fairly long project. This is in no way a project that you will get done in a weekend, oh no. But it can be fun and if you can do it in steps, I think that you'll get through it just fine. I will too. So I'm very excited about this project. I think it's gonna be beautiful. And I hope you stick with me through it. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Bye-bye. Welcome back. All right, so we're gonna get started on the front pieces. And there is a whole lot that's gonna be going into the center front because that's where all the buttonholes are gonna go. That's where most of the structural issues are gonna be going and everything with stays and all kinds of stuff. So this is gonna take probably all day, but that's okay, you know, it's a process. So what I'm gonna be doing is kind of a hybrid of concepts of Claire's, outlines from the pattern instructions, and my methods that make it easier, but still really strong and stable for me, okay? So it's gonna be kind of a mishmash of all those things. But I think it's gonna turn out really well. And I'm excited about this. I think that I've learned a lot. Going through the skirt was good first because it gave me an idea of how she works, how Claire works, how all of that stuff happens. And so now I have a better idea of how to make that tool work for me. So it's all good. Let me go ahead and turn the camera down. I'll show you what I'm doing. Okay, so this is my pattern piece. And you can tell that I've cut the fabric out a lot larger because I want to be able to um, kind of make some fine tuning tweaks as I'm going through this whole marking process. You'll see what I mean. But one of the first things that I'm going to be doing is actually fusing an entire piece of very lightweight interfacing to the back. And I'm only gonna be doing this for my center fronts, not for the rest of them. Um, mainly because I'm gonna be playing with this a lot. I have to hand embroider all these buttonholes. And because of that, I'm gonna be sitting there manipulating it and everything. And I want to make sure that this does not stretch out of shape. So, she recommended, Claire recommended in the pattern just to put little ovals of interfacing where those buttonholes are going to be. But because my interfacing is extremely lightweight, it's not going to change the weight or the texture or the overall feel of this fabric at all. 
it's just going to keep it from stretching out of shape. So that is the first thing I'm going to do is go fuse this on. And it is my basic interfacing that I use for so many things. If you can read that, that is it. I'm gonna turn it up. It's just very, very lightweight, fusible interfacing. I'll be right back. So the next thing I'm gonna do is pin just a couple little places just to hold my tissue paper to keep it from wanting to move. And very lightly so I don't misshape it. Okay. So we are going to be doing her thread tracing, but first I need to make some marks with my heat erasable pen. Okay. And I'm marking, this is my center front line here, this long one. So I'm drawing lines up like that. These are my buttonhole lines, which are very important to me. So I'm marking those as accurately as I can. I'm actually trying to make tiny little crosses inside of my little circles, but that's not working out too well. They're more like blobs. Um, this line here is the quilting line. And there is a little circle up here, and there's one down here, but the circle's printed off a little bit from the lines, but that's okay. I don't think that's a big deal. Now, um, this pattern includes a 5 8 seam allowance, okay? And I'm going to outline the pattern itself. We'll just take this one step at a time here, because she is going to want you to thread trace the stitching line but they do not provide the stitching line. I'm mar marking my notches on here too right now. So I'll so show you how that goes. This is the shoulder line where um, everything meets at the shoulder. So I'm putting that on for right now. And as always, I keep my pattern pieces handy because throughout the process, if a mark is not there and it's one that I need, I can always just grab the pattern piece and match it up and figure it out from there. Okay. So now I think I have everything marked on here and I'm going to take this pattern piece off and do a little bit of drawing. So the first thing I'm going to do is draw this center front line right here connecting these two. That goes all the way. I'm also going to be drawing the lines for my buttonholes. And at this point, I really, really want to make sure that my buttonholes are with the grain. Because I want my, you can see there's a very pronounced grain here, okay? I want my buttonhole to line up exactly in between two of those rows. Okay. I do have four buttonholes. I am not marking the pattern place or the pocket placement because that's easy. I'm just kind of situating it on the bottom. When the time comes, I can place that. This is the quilting line. It's somewhat diagonaled, so I'm just going to connect to those two. Now, because I shortened my jacket, I also shortened the quilting line. I want the quilting line to end about two inches above the bottom cutting line of my piece. That's going to give me plenty of room to manipulate things the way I need to. All right, so now that I have things marked this way, I actually need to draw the stitching lines on. And so having my cutting lines here makes it a lot easier. So just to make things obvious, I'm going to use the black pen for the stitching line. So I can line up my ruler at that 5 8 inch point. Okay, so I'm drawing the stitching lines in that way just by setting it inside by 5 8 inch. The um, parts that are curved, all I'm doing is just going to make a bunch of individual little dots and then connect them. <clears throat> so 
So here I have all of these little dots. And so I'm just going to freehand, come back, and draw a line connecting them. Okay, so there's my stitching line. So according to Claire's wishes, and actually for this process, I think it's a good thing I am going to thread baste it. I'm going to use my ancient red, slightly breakable um, thread just because it'll show up. And so let me just get my favorite needle. What I really need to do sometime is sit there with all of my packs of needles and figure out exactly what size and what style favorite needle is so that I can replace her when she disappears. But for now, we're not. All right, so the thread tracing needs to be visible on the right side. I'm drawing all this on the wrong side, but um, what I'm going to be doing for the seam lines is starting out here in the um, seam allowance. And I do knot it just because I tend to pull things, but I'm making sure that the knots are on the right side so that that way I can cut them off easily. I'm going to go all the way up to the end of my cutting line. Okay, just so happened my needle's on the back side here. Then I come over and come back up in this spot right here on the cross one and then I can start coming this way and what that is going to do is on the right side it's going to show you a very defined mark exactly where that corner is okay so I got that done and I had to go hunt for more needles I think I found the Sisters to Favorite Needle, which is a golden-eyed sharp from England, but her sisters are a bit rusty, so I need to find an emery strawberry to work on them. So I'm using red thread to outline my stitching line. I've got another decrepit old roll of thread here, which is purple, and that is going to be marking the um, just placement lines, like the center front, things like that. Things that are not necessarily the stitching lines, but they are things of note that we need to mark. So with Mr. Purple Thread here, I'm going to be marking the center front line. And again, I'm gonna be starting it with my knot on the front because that way I can cut it off and just going all the way up this center front line. So straight down in this edge of my buttonhole mark, straight up in this one. Flip it over. Make sure they are both on the same, same grain. Draw that over and up and down. So far, everything's lining up really well. So that's my process for marking the buttonholes. And lastly, on this side, I'm actually going to also make sure this lines up with my straight, draw another line just to get a side edge of my uh, buttonhole so they are all for sure lined up. When I iron this, all of these are gonna disappear, so that's fine. Okay, I wanted these on this side so that I can just see it clearly um, on both sides where these side edges are. So now we're gonna go on to the next step. So what the pattern is calling interfacing is a piece of organza. And I did not purchase silk organza. I purchased common everyday Ohio organza. And it is just as stiff. It might not be as lovely, but it is just as stiff and I think it'll give the structure it needs. So with that, there's a few things that I'm gonna be needing to do with this. But before I go too far, I'm going to make sure that the bottom is on grain with everything so, so that the structure is gonna hold.
All right, now there's a couple things I'm going to need to baste with this. And for this, I'm going to use my white basting thread. I know, right? So many things. My white basting thread, it's a strong thread. It's actually made for basting. Um, I'm using another secondary favorite needle sister. And so what I'm going to be doing first is basting again this center front line that I had in purple before, but I'm going to baste it in white just to hold these two together. I need to get my other thimble, which does better for flat things. See, this one has a rounded top, and it's a fabulous thimble. It fits me well, but it's not great for flat things. This one has more of a ridge on the top, and it's extra long, so it's better for flat. You know, things like that. So now that is done. Now, here's another place where I'm going to go off script a little bit. Um, what Claire wants us to do is do those diagonal basting stitches over the top of this quilting line, okay? Because we're just going to quilt this piece to this piece right now. Um, I ran into difficulties when I was making the skirt with those diagonal ones because the stitches hit them and then they're a pain to pull out. So actually what I'm going to do is run a row of basting stitches, you know, similar to it right along the side of it. You know, maybe a quarter inch away, and I think that that's going to hold it close enough. So, just, and I am going to be pulling this thread out very, very soon, so I can make my knot on the incorrect side here. So I'm just going to be basting about a quarter inch over, or maybe even less. So that is done. Now, what Claire wants you to do is look at it from the right side as you quilt it. I did it this way and I basted real near it so that I can look at the wrong side. And um, I think that's fine. So I'm gonna go over to my sewing machine, set my stitch length very wide. She wants up to a quarter inch wide, but my machine doesn't go that far. My, my widest is four millimeters, which is, you know, close to it. I think that's six inches. Six stitches per inch is a four millimeter or something like that. And I'm going to do that at the top to the bottom. All right, so if you can see, I have stitched along that quilting line and I'm using thread that matches my garment. So on this side, you really can't see that stitching. What I'm going to do right now is pull out my basting threads that ran straight alongside of that. I don't need those anymore. I have actually already done the other side, the side that does not have buttonholes, just because I wanted to work through all of this before um, I turned on the camera. And I figured out that this stuff shifts so much that it's it's kind of difficult to exactly match it up on the edges once you cut it. So because of that, and because I already have this seam line marked, um, I'm not going to do it on this side yet, but along this side, I'm going to, just in the seam allowance area, put a row of stitch witchery and fuse this to it. I have fused stitch witchery up here at the very top and down this side and when I fused it you can see it erased all those markings really nicely. Now I didn't want to get anywhere near this because I need to keep these buttonhole marks but this is just going to make it more secure. You know anything to keep problems from happening before is a good thing. So what I need to do now is surprise surprise baste another line. This time, what I have to do is baste this, um, what are we calling this? We're calling this interfacing. Baste the interfacing. That's what they're calling it in the pattern. Baste that line to the fabric at a point that is seven eighths of an inch in from the edge. 
There you go. So if my seam stitching line is at 5 eighths, the 7 eighths one is a quarter inch in from there, right? And just carefully, I'm just going to put a couple pins to hold it in place as I do this because organza moves. And again, I am going to be using my white stitching thread for this one. So here's my color code, and this is just my own thing. The white is temporary, and it's um, basically just for underneath, okay? The red is stitching lines where the permanent stitches are going to go. The purple are general placement lines marking important mileposts. That's my own code. I don't really see that written anywhere else, but that's just how I go. Um, you know, take it if you want or not. That is up to you. All right, so now, very carefully, I am basting up this mark that I just made at 7 eighths of an inch, and it goes all the way through both the fabric and the organza. So now I need to trim this edge of the organza. And I need to trim it half an inch from the cutting line. So I'm gonna line up my ruler here and here, and it should be an eighth of an inch inside my stitching line, which I basted. But just to make sure everything is nice and straight, marking that, okay. So now I'm going to come back and trim it carefully, making sure I don't cut my fabric. All right, now we're going to reinforce this edge with the salvage made stay tape. So this is a piece of salvage that I tore from the organza. Actually, let me clip this off. Now, what I realized is I tore it off and I ironed it, but just beyond the salvage, because you can tell where the, the fabric changes, you know, up here where all the holes are where the needles grab it, um, it's a lot stiffer and then it becomes a much looser weave out here. When I get into this area, it, um, it doesn't have the same structure, so it's going to want to curl. So I need to actually trim this down to a width that is pretty close to just where all of these little very, very stiff pinholes are. And I need to make it the length of this plus a couple inches. Okay, this is how it's going to turn out when we're all done, where it's this tape that is stitch just inside the stitching line. Okay, the red is the stitching line here. All right, that's what we're going for. So, what they want you to do, actually I'm gonna trim this just a little bit more, because see how it's wanting to curl? I don't know if you can. It's wanting to curve this way, and that is because the fabric on the inside or on the fabric-y side of that selvage is a little bit too wide. So I need to cut that because that's, it wants to shrink more than, the selvage wants to hold its shape, which is why she's using it on the straight. But if you leave too much fabric attached to it, it's going to want to curl. Okay, so now this should be straight. Okay, so it's time to place this. So you gotta kind of be careful because you have so many lines going on. Trust me, it's very easy to get this messed up because I have before. So what I need to do is put the edge of this tape alongside the edge of the stitching line. And the stitching line is the one that is five eighths of an inch in from the edge. And it's marked in red thread, okay? Then up at the top here, and then you just clip in. So here's my, my thing here. I clip, this is a quarter inch wide. So however wide your strip is, if you measure in that amount and you clip down almost to the edge, you'll get a square. 
All right, so since mine is about a quarter inch wide, I stopped about a quarter inch away and made that clip. And then I'm also going to pin it here so that the edge, the hard edge of my tape, is going right along that red thread basted stitching line all the way down here. So now what I'm going to do is starting at the very top and working my way down, and I am using my white thread, um, I'm going to baste right down the middle of this. And I tie a knot and the knot's on the, um, the wrong side here, but that's okay because I know I'm going to be pulling this out again very soon. And these are just long basting stitches just to hold the tape in place while I make my permanent stitches. So just as I'm stitching, double checking that the edge lines up with the line with the red threads. So now hopefully you can see I have just big old basting stitches holding this tape on. Okay, so now guess what we need to do? We need to come back and put hand felling stitches up and down the edges. And I don't think you really need to watch me do that, but this is the one I did last night. And you can see, hopefully, I did do them in white because I want everything to match. Um, I can actually come back and take that basting stitch out. I haven't done that yet on this one. But you can see I just have it um, on the outside and the inside. Now the inside ones, if you're using a really lightweight fabric and you don't want it to show through, just catch the organza layer, okay? This outside one, it's gotta go through everything, okay? But still, try to make it so it doesn't show. And my fabric is so thick that it's not gonna show. Um, it seems like there was something else, but I can't remember right now. So let's say I've already done it and I can come back now and clip this center basting thread and pull it out up here and that's what I will be doing with this one. So the way that I stitch it is little felling stitches. They're probably you know about a quarter inch apart. So basically I'm going down along that stitching line and my like I said my fabric is very thick so I can do this invisibly. Come back up just a little bit inside the tape, make a little sideways stitch over, so I go back down into that stitching line, and then come back up over here. All right, so I have my tape all stitched on, and I've pulled out that basting thread that went down the middle of it, and I can also pull out the thread that's right here, the one that I did at 7 eighths of an inch in. I can just pull that out because that's not necessary anymore. In the pattern, they have you make more of a keyhole type buttonhole. I'm actually going to be making more of just a standard flat buttonhole, and that is kind of more in line with what Claire's doing in her book. If if I can find that page. Um, so I'm making my knot slightly different from hers and slightly different from the pattern though because let me go see if I can find my scrap. So this was kind of like my little scrap that I made while I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do and I was testing different types of interfacing and this is just the standard interfacing which is what I have on here. I did a woven which worked fine. Both of these worked fine. This is that Trico, um, but this worked well, so I'm going with it. Now, what Claire was doing in her book was just a standard, standard uh, buttonhole opening, and she was putting it so the knots are up on top, and she was using a single thread. Okay, that was hers. Now, she even says, everyone says, the backs are going to be ugly. Ignore the backs, we're going to cover those with bound buttonhole looking things in the back. It's the front we need to worry about. So that was that one. This one I did with a double thickness of thread. 
okay but the knot's still up on the top still not a fan this is what I'm going to go with it's the knots on the inside and it's a double thickness of thread but I was also trying to make sure that I placed my threads kind of in line with the grain of the fabric and I think that looks a lot better so that's the one I'm going to be going with even the back looks better on that one okay so what I need to do is actually uh, stitch this by machine first and because I don't want anything to shift, I am actually going to baste one more time. I know, crazy. Um, so this is my buttonhole, all right? I am actually going to come and basically baste in a loose circle around each buttonhole just to hold everything for sure because this part up here might still want to move. First, once I have all of these basted just loosely around their perimeter, you know, giving me at least half an inch on each side, then we're going to go to the sewing machine. All right, so hopefully you can see I have basting threads going around the buttonholes. Okay, so now I can pull out my white basting thread that ran up the center front. The purple one, which is marking that placement from the right side, that is still there. But my white one that was just holding the organza layer to the fabric layer, that is now gone. So it's important to get all of this done because now I'm going to go over to the sewing machine. And basically what I'm going to be doing is using a very, very narrow straight stitch. Um, prob not narrow, it's straight, it is narrow, but very short, like less than a two millimeter stitch. I'm going to be stitching down one side, go over maybe two stitches, back up, go over two stitches, and just make a tiny, long, skinny, narrow rectangle around each one of these. I'm going to go up this row here, go over two, and then come back down this row. That way, because I'm going to be using these stitching lines to reinforce my um, buttonhole. So if I put my stitching line out here and out here and I slice it in the middle, okay, so if I put it here, here, and I slice it down this middle where my mark actually is, then when I stitch, I can come over and grab to reinforce that. Okay, so I'm going to be using the thread on my sewing machine that matches my fabric because it's going to stay. It is permanent. So I'm over here at my machine. I want to walk you through the process. So the first thing I'm doing is where I'm actually going to be sewing my buttonhole. I am clipping this basting thread here because if you sew really tightly over that you're never going to get it out there will always be just a little hint of purple in those stitches and I don't want that so here it is and I've marked it really well so I can see it from the right side and that's what I'm going to look at okay I am using my narrow foot and that is because it's easier for me to see so remember with the plan of the um, place where the red line is is where I'm cutting and I'm sewing on the next weave over on this side and the next weave over on that side. So I'm going to come over and before I put my presser foot down, I want to very carefully make sure that my needle is going to go down in the spot that I want it to. So I have my needle down in the spot I need it to start. I have my stitch length at one and a half millimeters and I'm going to be carefully guiding it straight down this weave. making sure I stop where that crossbar is. Lift it up. And I'm going to go straight across to, so I think it takes me like three stitches. I'm just turning it by hand to get to the next one. And I am sewing straight down the weave on this side of my mark now. To get to that crossbar. Lift it up, turn it. You know what? I'm going to backstitch. I think it's fine. I think my fabric is so thick, no one's ever going to notice. 
and I need the stability in my life right now. So, backstitch that. I can pull it out. And trim that. So the back, what it looks like is this. Okay, so I have a little rectangle. It's going straight around where my buttonhole is going to be. So technically now that that rectangle is there, I could pull out these basting stitches, but I'm just going to leave them there while I'm working it by hand because it just can't hurt. Okay, so this is my wrong side and I have all of my buttonholes sewn. So at this point, I'm going to iron the whole thing and erase all of my pen marks because everything that I need to know should be thread marked or outlined. So it's kind of a moment of truth to see what is left. Okay. So that cleaned up really easily. And this is what I have left with now. So now it's time to get started sewing buttonholes. I had to grab a couple needle threaders because I had broken up mine. I want to show you a glimpse into my... This is a box I call Thimbles and Threaders. And I saw... And I, I love thimbles. I just really do. I have a lot that are just way too big. Um, a lot that are way too small. It's like a Goldilocks thing. Too big, too small. Just right. This one is just right, but it is so ugly. But it is just right. So I'm going to pull that one out. Sometimes I just like to switch them. This one fits really well too. It's a beautiful little Mexican sterling one. Um, this one I love, but I used it up. See, there's a hole. Well, maybe you can't see. But there is a hole all the way through. I was pushing really hard one day on something, and that needle went straight into my finger. So I love her dearly, but I need to figure out a way to fix her. I think if I could just push a um, piece of metal or something to the tip, that might work. But this one was my great grandmother's. She gave that to me, so I don't want to get rid of it. This one is beautiful too. It's just a little too narrow. It might fit on my pinky, but you know that's not helpful. So anyhow, lots of stuff. El Capitan coffee. That's lovely. So let me get back to work. Alright, so I do not have silk buttonhole twist. Just outright, don't even know where I would look around here to get something like that, but I do have a lot of embroidery floss. This is the one I did for my sample. It's way too dark. So I'm just setting that aside so you know this is not what we're going to end up with. I actually think that this one, which is a very light peach, it's called Peach Flesh, number 754. That's the one I'm going to be using. I think it matches really well. So what I do is I get a piece that is plenty long. Well, first I need to untangle this. Give me a second. Let me untangle this for a minute and I'll be right back. I usually like to get a piece that's about 24 inches long and I wax it. Hang on a second. It's, it's a weird combination. You need it long enough to work with but not so long that it tangles because you know it will. So I do it doubled here, two strands, and I do wax them. as their two-stranded version. And then I'm going to put them through my needle and work with it doubled again. So, so I need my needle threader. So I'll be ending up working with four strands at a time. So the first thing I did is with my sharp little scissors, I just came in and sliced just through the organza layer. And then I'm sticking a pin at the very edges of each side, okay? And coming on this side now, my marks are disappeared, obviously, because I did iron it, but that's telling me exactly where I need to stop. So, well, actually, I can just redraw it here, and I have it marked exactly where I need to stop. And I'm just gonna be extremely careful 
It's a blessing and a curse that my thread mar matches so well that it's kind of difficult to see from this side where that stitching line is. But when I get close to it, I'll go to the opposite side. So over here, I can see more of where that thread is going to end. I'll just put my scissors right up to the edge and close on it so that now it's open. Okay, but I want to clip it from the right side to make sure I stay right along that weave line until I get to that point. I think I can, I think I saw it there. All right, so that's the first thing is go ahead and cut all of your stitches open, um, you know, pull out the trash all the little hairy stuff. The organza leaves a lot of hairs. So pull all of that out too, just like that. So with it open like this and fairly clean, I'm gonna come back. Claire uses Elmer's glue. I'm gonna use my clear nail polish and just open it up a little bit and kind of coat that inside area. Just like that, just running it back and forth. Just gives it a little body, keeps anything from wanting to misbehave later. I'm just gonna let that sit there and dry out for a moment. Okay, so I'm gonna be putting the cording around my buttonhole first. And this is the edge, this is the inside of the jacket, okay? So I'm gonna start out here, maybe, you know, three quarters of an inch away from my um, buttonhole. And I'm gonna come up, remember I'm gonna be stitching just on this row right here. So I'm gonna bring my needle up at that point, leave some tails out here. Go straight across and go down at the end of the buttonhole. And my buttonhole is going to be fairly rectangular. It's not going to be round. And then come up. Uh, come on. Up here. Go straight back down. Go down in a similar place, just on the other side of that buttonhole. And then I'm going to come back up out here and cut it with some tails. Okay, I'm going to be using these while I'm sewing my buttonholes to give them strength. And if my buttonhole stretches out of shape while I'm working on it, these are like cinches. I can pull those and it'll cinch it back into place. So I'm going to do that for each buttonhole. So at this point, my buttonholes have been basted, stitched, cut, cleaned, glued or nail polished, corded, and now we're actually gonna get started making the buttonhole stitch. So I'm dealing with two doubled threads. So I have four strands all together here, and I have it knotted at the end. So I'm just gonna start from the top and about 3 eighths of an inch away, I'm gonna put it straight down and bring my needle up into the buttonhole. So I'll have a knot just hanging out up here. I'll be cutting that off when I'm done. But it can just sit there for right now. It won't hurt anything. So you bring it, you brought your needle up through the inside of the buttonhole, okay? And I am making one stitch every weave. I think that that looks balanced. So I put just the tip of my needle down and I bring it back up where I want it to and see how it's on the other side of my cording. I have my cording on the inside of it. So then I bring my thread around it like a blanket stitch and bring it up. But when I'm almost done, before I bring it tight, I'm gonna tip it back towards the center of the buttonhole and pull it tight that way because I want my knot, the purl of my knot to be along the inside edge. And by doing that, that's where it's gonna go instead of out here. So I'm gonna do it again at the next weave. So I have it coming up just beyond my cording. 
wrapping it around, pulling it through and then turning it down and cinching it in, okay? So can you see how that's like making a blanket stitch but upside down where the little beads or pearls are on the inside? Okay, so I'm just gonna do a couple of these for you to see and then I'm gonna just work on my own until I get to the end and I'll show you how I deal with the end. Okay, I'm getting up here to the end and I'm gonna kind of make a half circle. Now this is the edge that's towards the uh, front opening of the jacket. Now if it gets loose, I can just pull these two little threads down here and it'll tighten it up for me. Okay, so I'm back where I started. This is the edge where the buttons are going to want to pull, okay? This side here, what I'm going to do is make more of like a tack at the end. So I'm going to put a Red going straight across like this. Questioning if I have enough thread. What I like to do is come and buttonhole across there, but I don't think I have enough thread. And so whatever I do here, I'm going to do on all of them. So I think I'm just going to call that good. I'm going to put two big tack stitches at the end to hold it nicely on that side. And then on this side, I'm just going to put a little back stitch inside here like that. And cut it off. On this side where this knot is, it's pretty well buried in there now. So I'm just going to clip it off. I'm going to bring my two, um, these are my cord threads, cinch them up so my buttonhole is nice and tight and tie them into a nice little knot. Square knots are always interesting because you do one the opposite way than feels comfortable. so. Okay, so I got those tied up. I'm going to clip it off like that. And then I can pull this basting thread out. And we have one that is done. So. You know, I think that looks pretty nice, pretty strong, and I'm going to go ahead and do the other three exactly the same way. Okay, the buttonholes are done. Turned out really pretty. The back isn't that bad. I mean, I've seen a lot worse. So I think that it'll do, definitely do. Now the last thing I need to do for the buttonholes is work on the back. And to disguise the back, you need to get a piece of your lining fabric and make it into about a two inch wide strip. I need a couple of these things. It doesn't have to be exact, you know, but just about two inches wide because it's easy to deal with a width like that. Going over to the ironing board, fold it in half. I'm going to starch it too and uh, put, press a nice crease into it. So this is my strip. Um, I starched it, folded it in half, and pressed it, and I need to cut it into two inch wide sections, and I need two sections for each buttonhole. Okay, 
So I've got two pieces for each buttonhole and I'm going to be putting them with the folded side together and I'm going to place them so that the edges um, come just to the center here, okay? So let me put a little pin. It's a rusty looking little pin, isn't it? To clean that out. So I have one here and the other one's going to be right here. And when this is all done, it's going to look like a bound buttonhole from the back. And from the front, it's going to look like a embroidered buttonhole. And I guess this is a Chanel type. Um, she says that this is done in Chanel and it also was done in the House of Worth, which is, you know, the origin of couture. So that's kind of cool. So from that, this side, you know, I'll have my lining opening around it. But from this side, it looks like this. And from the back side, it's going to look like this. So what I need to do now is get a needle and thread with a thread that matches my fabric and sew these on, which is little running stitches, um, probably about a quarter inch away. And I'm just going to outline the whole thing with it. All right, so you can see I've just stitched them on and I sewed them so that the threads don't show up on the right side. Okay, so we're very close to finishing up with the preliminary work on this front piece. What I need to do now is actually cut it to size. So what I need to do is draw my cutting lines back on here. And I'm going to draw it on the wrong side because I can. So we know that it's a 5 8 inch seam allowance. So again, I am drawing my line here and I wanted to wait until after I got all of this done to cut out my final size just in case something got tweaked or something got stretched or something like that. Um, I would have enough play. And so now I feel comfortable. So I'm just going to go ahead and do it. So what I'm doing is just adding a seam allowance down to the edge. And I can come back and trim along that line. Now remember this side right here, I have stitch witchery fused in this seam allowance. So the organza is going to hold very well. Okay, so um, over here, there's enough stitching that I don't think that I'm going to worry about this side at all. Down here, I will probably slip a piece of um, stitch witchery into this bottom seam allowance and also along this neckline right here before I cut off these parts. But other than that, that's how I'm going to do it. So all that to get back to this place. Now I'm putting my pattern piece back on top to make sure everything's lining up. And at this point, I'm going to come back and just draw in where these notches are, where this dot is up here, another notch, another dot, um, just to have that for when it's actually time to put everything together. And then these two dots here that mark center front. I mean, actually, it's not a bad idea just to redraw that center front line. It won't hurt anything on this side. And when I go to do my final ironing, it will come off. But that's going to help me when I'm lining things up. So there you go. The front piece. Thank you.